In a few moments, you can hear Big Ben ringing out the old year and ringing in the new. Happy New Year to you all. And now the weather forecast for coastal waters of England and Wales until 1800. Pressure will remain high to the west and the trough of low pressure will remain low. UFOs. Hey everyone, Mike Rosso here, Film Photography Podcast, broadcasting from our satellite studio in Cleveland, Ohio. It's a great place to be. I'm um, here with Leslie Lazenby. Hi everyone. Matt Barrage. Hey, hello. Owen McCafferty. Cleveland Rocks. And did I say I'm Mike Rosso? Um, is that who you are today? That's who I am today. Today we're going to be talking about learning the basics of movie making. Folks out there may have noticed FPP as you know, it's almost like the Polaroid craze of 2012. Absolutely. <laughs> it's the motion craze of 22, hammering folks like, hey, grab this camera for $10 on eBay and load up a $20 roll of film. Grab a projector for 5 bucks. It doesn't have to be expensive, and it's a whole lot of fun. Owen's going to be talking about the basics of movie making. After a piping hot cup of coffee, I'm going to hype Matt. I'm going to gas Matt up <laughs> on shooting 16-millimeter film. I'm going to field all his questions. I'm going to talk about lenses. And all sorts of stuff. We'll see if it happens. Bring some Beano. <laughs> we'll be right back. This is the time when you go out and you get what you really wanted for Christmas and pay for it with what you got and didn't want. So whether you're trading in Aunt Millie's gift or spending Christmas money, now's the time to get the simplest camera in the world, Polaroid's One Step. Here's a camera you never focus. You just press the button, a motor hands you the picture, and you see it in minutes. Just tell the story you'd rather have a one step. Your Aunt Millie won't mind. People always take back Aunt Millie's presents. I did. I did. I did. Hey, we're back. Hey, we're back. So, uh, Owen McCafferty and I, uh, we're like the filmmaking buddies. We've been chit chatting. Two on washer the- women. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> And I will say this. You may be saying to yourself, oh, who is this guy? Where is John Fideli? Why is this guy here? Well, Owen, you're the best, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> number well, that's one, not what you said last night, Mike. Number one, you're patient. Okay? It's very, people at home may be saying, hey, how can I get to be in that FPP? I want to be in the FPP. No, you don't. Don't do it. It involves patience. And when I say patience, I mean years mm-hmm. of patience. So I think I first met Owen 20, in 2015. And then he sent me an email saying, hey, I have an idea for a blog. I don't remember what it was. Probably it isn't posted yet. <laughs> You're exactly right. I'm almost certain it's still in your inbox. Yeah. But, you know, it's like I said, okay, great. I said, and I said right up front, I like, it's going to take a long time. It's going to take a long time to get posted. But you were persistent, not in a bad way. You were cool, and then you kept kept going. Like, oh, I have another blog, and then I said, oh, okay, and there were good topics. <laughs> so not good enough to be on the blog, though. The blogs got posted. <laughs> you were persistent. Met you at the FPP uh, meetup in 2015, and then as as on the business end of things, things started skewing uh, with me personally. With you know, home entertainment and VHS and DVD. That's long over. People don't even know what that is. Into uh, what how I originally started in business, which is corporate managing media, Mm -hmm. which is analog to digital conversions on a corporate side of film libraries, motion picture film libraries, feature films. So I invested my company, Film Media, into all of the the state-of-the-art equipment, which set up FPP, 
to now carry properly and make movie film for defunct wind-up cameras, which I'm sure you pitched also. Like, hey, you know, there's only one type of double eight, you know, which is regular eight millimeter. Wouldn't it be great to have color? Wouldn't it be great to have this? What about double perf 16? So it all evolved, and you had the patience to, to, you know, kind of like just you were interested and, you know, offline, he didn't care about, like, it wasn't about him. It was really about the medium. And that's what's most important. Like, we're all here about the medium. So for folks listening who haven't tuned out yet, <laughs> if they're thinking about getting into movie making, what, where do you go? Yeah, we, I get that question a lot, which is, you know, is there a video I can watch? Is there a blog I can watch? And, and there are. One of the things, the problems that I see with a lot of newer stuff that's published about movie making is that sometimes it's either geared towards really professional equipment or slightly newer equipment. And for folks, especially if you're shooting regular 8mm or you're shooting you know, older 16mm equipment, there's not a lot of newer publications that really go in depth into how to use the camera and what the, you know, what the general principles are for movie making. And to me, like the best resources for, for really understanding the basics of how how movie making works, everything from how your camera works to how the film works to how you should shoot your subject matter. You have to look to older literature, which is great because this older literature is super, super cheap. So I have a stack of books here that I would really recommend to anybody who wants to get into movie making you know, for the first time, or maybe you've been shooting movies for a long time and and still have questions on, on something. If you're like me, you know, I've been shooting on movie film since 2002, and I came to these books kind of later in life to kind of understand a little bit more in depth, um, you know, behind like what what is the the strategy for setting up a shot, etc. So there's there's really I've got a stack of books, but really there's like one book and then a couple of other pamphlets that I would recommend. But the main book, the most iconic book um, that was published by Eastman Kodak Company, is How to Make Good Movies, and they orig- originally published it. I want to say in the late 30s, because on the inside cover you'll see the very first regular 8mm movie camera. This is definitely a dated book in that, and I'll, and I'll read you a quote, it's a picture of a man and a woman sitting in a you know stereotypical uh, suburban home, and he's reading a book, and of, of course she has a magazine, because, you know, why would a woman have a book, right? You know, this is 1938. And, and he says, how to make good movies. Here's the book we want to read, all right. And she says, our movies seem pretty grand to me just the way they are. Why bother reading a book? You know, so it is a little dated, for sure. But the, um, the subject matter in, in here, and it, you know, this particular version, this is the original one, is over 200 pages long. And it goes everything from you know, what cameras are out there, what kind of film was out there at the time, how to shoot in color, how to shoot indoors, how to shoot outdoors, how to do trick shots, um, animation. I mean, the whole gamut. And it's written for the amateur. It's written for somebody who either has never shot movie film before or um, you know, has just been shooting for a couple of years. So Kodak released this in the late 30s, early 40s. And they re-released it several times over the years. The next one, I believe, was in, let's see here, 1958. They retitled it, How to Make Good Home Movies. Similar subject matter, but now it's in color. It's updated, really geared more towards regular 8. There's not a lot in here about 16, except for 16mm magazines. This is a little bit more condensed, but you know what's great about these books is that they, they show you how to use the older equipment. You know, people people write into the FPP all the time. I got this brownie movie camera. I, I you know they don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to use it. They don't know how to set the lens. It, you know, these books tell you how to do that, and they're just as relevant today if you're using that old equipment. They re-released this again, this book, uh, and they called it Movies Are Fun in 1966. I think that was the last version, maybe, and that was updated for Super 8. Okay. But other otherwise, these books are all three of these books are the same. How to make good movies. How to Make Good Home Movies and Movies Are Fun. All really great reads um, by Eastman Kodak Company. You can find them on the used market for, I think I paid under a dollar probably for most of these. And they're great. So that's the iconic one I'd recommend. There's a couple of others. I mean, um, the Kodak Home Movie Camera Guide. This one's like a paperback. Another one you can find for like a buck. It's a little misleading. It's not really a camera guide so much as how to take moving pictures. Bell and Howell had a movie camera guide. This one's more of a, 
you know, the different types of Bell & Howell movie cameras. On the back, this publisher offered ones for Bell & Howell movie cameras, Canon movie cameras. Another one that's interesting is the Kodak Movie News. <laughs> this was a pamphlet that was released from the 40s into the 1960s by Kodak. It was done quarterly. This also, ha- I mean, this one's great because it even has, like, uh, questions to the editor. Um, you know, could you give me a comparative daylight lens settings for Kodachrome, which you know, isn't relevant now? You know, how do I use the titles for movie making? And then it even goes into how to set up um, fall shots as well. On the back, this one's really cool. It actually shows how f- uh, movie film was processed at Kodak and how it was slit. Whoa. Regular eight. Regular eight. That's, that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. That, those you can find pretty cheap. Sometimes you'll find a lot of them, so you get like you know five or six years worth. This is a picture here of a man with a projector and a record player next to yeah, it. Yeah. It, it, you could sync up sound. It was like elevator music. That's right. While mm-hmm. you watched movies. Pretty cool. There are volumes of it. Yeah. As a matter of fact, at one of the walking workshops, a FPP listener gave me a series of of records. <gasps> really? He's like, "Oh, you got to have these." Whoa. And they're all they're all moods. We should, we should I should. For those. Yeah, that would be terrific. Look at that. Man with a record player and a projector. The other one I have, this one's uh, kind of racy. It's got a woman in a bikini on it. <laughs> oh. Um, 1972. Oh. This one's called Better Movies in Minutes, New Movies Without Movie Lights. This one was released for the advent of Ektachrome 160. Um, but, you know, similar thing. It, it, it gives you the basics of movie making. So if you've got, if you or somebody that you know wants to get into movie making, maybe they're a little timid, maybe they're not confident in their, in their movie making skills, these books are great resources. You can find them on places like abebooks.com for, mm-hmm. you know, a buck, two bucks. Those are to me. Those are the best resources. Um, sometimes I, I see videos on YouTube, uh, with the exception of the FPP, where somebody shows an old movie camera, and they either don't, you know, they'll just like show it and not really tell you how to use it, or they give you really bad information, like you, putting the putting the spool of film in, and they can't get it in, so they jam it to break it the right. plastic. Just jamming on. Um, <laughs> this, you know, these books aren't going to do that to you. These books were written when those cameras were new, and they're going to I mean, I'm not a genius. I don't just, like, learn this stuff by osmosis. <laughs> I read these books. That's how, I, that's how I'm able to answer questions when, they, when people send them to me. So, you know, if you, do, if you want to learn more, there you go. East Mancota Company publications are a great, great resource. So, Thank you, Owen. Anytime. I think, it's a, I think we should uh, gas up Matt. Gas it. I mean, let's talk about format. I mean, I, here's, yeah. a, here's a question that I... Re- First of all, I receive questions a few times a week, if not more, and I answer all of them. Most of them are basic questions, and you can understand because most folks today are digital shooters, and they don't know anything. So, mm-hmm. And this is a good question. Customer says, hey, I just bought a Kodak Brownie, 8 millimeter camera. Can I take a Super 8 cartridge, <laughs> break open the cartridge, and somehow use that film in this camera? Right. Because Super 8 is so readily available, right. most you know existing camera stores carry Super 8 film. Right. Great question. The answer, of course, is no. They're, let's talk about regular 8mm. Most people remember their grandparents having the 50-foot 8mm. Or great-grandparents. Yes. Or great-great-grandparents, depending on who's, the age of who's listening. <laughs> the 50-foot 8mm reel of film, you know, 50 mm-hmm. feet don't have the concept that fact that that film started as 16 millimeters in width right but it's just perforated specially for regular eight and that it's on a little 25 cute 25 foot roll daylight spool so you could load it in dim light and that you would shoot it and then you would take it out flip it and then shoot the other side mm-hmm. i mean my dad first told me about that before he got his uh, camera stolen in wildwood new jersey he was like, oh, yeah, I used to have the camera. You used to have to flip the film. That concept is it's, it's so old. And bravo. I mean, you know, for all the, the mishaps or misshooting or the, you know, errors that occur of film shooters shooting double eight that are FPP customers, mm-hmm. a majority of them are shooting just fine. Yeah. Yep. Minor problems, mostly exposure. We have regular eight millimeter. Then, of course, we have 16 millimeter, which actually was the first format for home. Yep. Back in the day, the 16 millimeter was uh, double perforated, which means there were perforated perforations on birth, both sides of the film. Birth sides. Birth sides of the film. <laughs> and then I don't know what year when Super 16 was invented, just like Super 8. Later, pretty late. The brain trusts at Eastman Kodak <laughs> Company figured out, like, oh, hey. We can get more, oh, hey. more, more picture by eliminating 
perfs on one side, mm-hmm. creating single perf 16 millimeter. You could use in a Bolex. Bolex still had a square right. frame. It gets a little confusing. I mean, it really yeah. does. Well, and I and I do think I thought I could be wrong, and some somebody I'm sure will tell me if I'm wrong. But I I believe that single perf was created to um, to accommodate optical sound. That's possible too. Now, folks listening, especially if there are any eggheads listening that are really into technicalities. Yeah, that's me, John Link. Uh, as you know, on Facebook, there are a lot of boards where a lot of those guys are very technical. Yep. I'm not going to say they're creative, <laughs> but they're technical. <laughs> that's a sound bite, Mike. We're really speaking from, I know this sounds really corny, we're speaking from the heart here. We're, we go out and shoot family events. I shoot my mom um, cutting meatloaf with a <laughs> 1960s electric knife. Hey, Mom! The meatloaf! We want it now! The meatloaf! Mom! The meatloaf! Cutting meatloaf with a <laughs> 1960s electric knife. How hard is her meatloaf? She needs to use <laughs> that and corned knife. beef. Should be put the butter knife. My mom likes to use the electric knife. Okay, for her. Yeah, right. Sears special? No, probably uh, Hamilton. Proctor Silex or a Hamilton Beach. Hamilton Beach. Beach. Yeah. It's olive green. Olive green. <laughs> I've just olive borrowed olive? my mom's not too long ago. The meatloaf! We want it now! We're here to jumpstart you to shoot. We're not here to be like in the specific year Kodak introduced Super 16 because it really doesn't matter. It doesn't. No one cares. No, it just it doesn't matter. For all the folks that I correspond with that, you know, through the FPP, most are buying these vintage Keystone wind-up 16-millimeter cameras. Mm -hmm. And most of those, the cheapest ones, need double perforated 16-millimeter. Now, I've seen Mm -hmm. a film shot where someone shot, miraculously shot, single perf in a double perf camera. It was a smeary mess. Oh. Miraculously, he got it through the camera. And miraculously, the worst smeary images. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are things folks don't know. So if they go to the FPP and buy a, a roll of new ectochrome, which is single perf, mm-hmm. they may not know till they open the film. So I, I pull out every stop in literature I send with when someone orders film to saying right on the product page at filmphotographystore.com, hey, if you're unsure, send me an email. I'll be more than happy to tell you what film you could use in your camera. Mm-hmm. Generally speaking, you could use double perf in any 16 millimeter camera. Doesn't yeah, matter. Absolutely. So that's yeah. the safest way to go. Double perforated. Agreed. Cannot use 16 millimeter film in an 8 millimeter camera, even though the film is 16 millimeter in width. And then, of course, the, the most popular format, which is Super 8, that I know was introduced in 1965. It's my. It's your favorite format, isn't it? Uh, it's all, it's the only <laughs> format I shot as a kid because I only had my dad's camera. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's as simple as that. It's like. That's all I had, and I, there was no eBay back then. So, you know, film format, regular 8, Super 8, 16 millimeter. Then you get into the sub the subcategories of yep. black and white or color, but then you get in the sub-subcategory of negative film or reversal film. I mean, let's talk about film real estate, Matt. Yeah. I mean, Matt is into large format. So the large format of movie making, of course, well... 70 it's, millimeter? It's 65 <laughs> yeah. millimeter, yeah. but... You know, 35 millimeter is, you know... A, it's still a, king, yeah. King. A, you know, it's it's a luxury that's beyond most home shooters. Mm-hmm. The cameras are big. Sure. Um, Even beyond most schools. Yeah. yeah. The closest thing that's available, It's when I say close, it's not close at all, but it's it's in the spirit of, is the Lomography Lomo Kino, which, gosh darn it, I wish they would think about just modifying that a little bit. If they made the Lomo Kino so that you could adapt, demount, the little screw right. yeah. D-mount lens is also known as the security camera lens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, C-mount lenses? Uh, the C-mount, which is go on Bolexes, that is D-mount. Oh, those are the tinier ones. Tinier ones. I think uh, I think folks were doing that for some of the dig stuff, too. The micro four-thirds, they were taking those same lenses. Wow. Absolutely. They just barely cover the sensor. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm not even looking for a motor. I'm not, the, my <laughs> wish list is not very high for the Lomo Kino. Mike, you're reminding me. I saw this. This was like it was probably like a couple months back. But there was this. Uh, there was this kid. He took built a board like a, like a breadboard with like an Arduino, and then he 3D printed a whole 35 millimeter camera. And he was adapting. I think they were. It might have been FD mount or something lenses on it. 
But then, you know, I, I think I, show, I yes. showed you a quick clip of the footage, and you're like, ah, same. It's this, really the same thing as Lomo Kino, though, where it just doesn't have that. Give us, give us a one metal piece. It's that <laughs> gate. Hold it flat. Yeah. Did you he know? do just, it as a school project? Or no, this is just like an independent thing. Like, just I want him to 3D print my own 35 mil camera. But it, I mean, he he had frame rates. He had like mm. it was almost there. It's mm. great when you see uh, a person do something so intense. Yeah, I mean, like that's that. that's. Uphill, trying yeah. to make that happen. Yeah, the Lomo Kino, it's ever popular. Lomography is tops in my book. They, I mean, they support one ten film. They still support one ten film. The only reason one ten is alive. Gosh darn it! It's a subject for another day. I wish someone would embrace them. Hopefully, one twenty six cartridge oh, film. I pray every day. There's millions of them. Point and shoot one twenty six cameras at your thrift store right now for a dollar. Yeah, but the Lomo Kino, it's ingenious because. It's a, what's known as a two perf system. So it's shooting, it's shooting an actual format. So two perf uh, commercial shooters who would shoot commercials on thirty five millimeter shoot two perf because it's half the frame of a thirty five millimeter mm-hmm. long, mm-hmm. and it has that that longer aspect ratio, yep. which makes it you know cinematic. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So Lomo Kino, we we offer scanning service for it at the FPP because our setup has presets in it. And 2Perf is an actual professional format. Mm-hmm. Nice. When I started shooting Lomo Kino 10 years ago, <laughs> I was scanning it in the V700 oh, each frame, frame by frame. frame. frame, by frame. Then I was stitching it together back then in um, uh, Microsoft Movie Maker, which comes in, oh. comes in wow, every... Wow, that's a yeah. flashback. <laughs> yeah, it comes in every... Mm. Uh, was that an XP? Yeah, Windows XP. Uh, and it was always a frustrating affair because each... Each scan also would not line up. Like you, I'd have to line up individually. It was a very um, what's a good word? Is it arduous task? Yeah, it was a task, and it was boring, and it was it was not fun. When FPP invested in the scanner, it was like, oh my god! I took all of my Lomo Kino film and I rescanned it all in 2K or maybe 4K. Yeah, what's the highest you can? So like. I know, like any scanner, will always tell you the highest it can do. But real estate wise, what's the what are like the reasonable expectations out of the different formats? So let's say somebody's shooting um, eight or du- or you know super eight, super eight, double eight. What's what's the reasonable expectation for scanning that versus sixteen mil versus Lomo Kino? Do you got those numbers? Mm-hmm. They're different animals for different reasons because okay. Lomo Kino, although you're shooting thirty five millimeter, the camera isn't perfected so that when the film's going through the gate, it's not steady. There's no pressure plate so there's no registration there's no registration okay it's hit or miss and it depends how you crank it so lomo kino it's a square little plastic box you load a 36 exposure roll of 35 millimeter film and you hand crank weren't there some folks that were doing mods on the lomo kino yes. where you could do like a power drill because yes. i have power tools now like maybe just like pop that on a oh, low speed like a sound spe- sync or just to make it more no just to make it more consistent mm-hmm. when they're running mm-hmm. it through they'll just like lowest speed on your power drill and zzz, like yes that's smart they were it was pretty now, cool back in the day back charlie chaplin days they would have songs that they would sing to keep mm-hmm. them on and i don't know if, i'm sure if you google it there are songs that the camera operators would sing to keep themselves on or they would just use a metronome let's talk about 4k yeah because um, every, everything is like you know in the dig like you can't even sell like phones have to have 4k 60 now so like what's what's the reasonable expectation if somebody is uh maybe they're sh- they're used to shooting on their iphone 13 pro max what can they get into that's gonna feel feel like film but also have some have some meat, some resolution. Well, I mean, let's let's here, let's so. leave the Lomo Kino for a second and go to like either sixteen, eight, or Super Eight. Great, so great. a lot of folks are sending their film in. They're you know they're either sending their film to us for scanning or having us do development scanning. Mm-hmm. Most folks, unless they're working in the field, are kind of confused about HD, two K, four K. Yep. In their mind, they think by getting four K, they're getting the best quality. Yes. The fact is, it's just size. So we're talking about four K. Which is I don't know thirty eight forty by twenty one sixty yep. pixels. Okay, talking about two K, which is that's like a little more than HD, right? A little more than HD twenty five sixty by fourteen forty, and an HD nineteen twenty by ten eighty. Ten eighty. Yeah. The quality of the scan is exactly the same. So Dave at the FPP, he's scanning the film, he's color grading in DaVinci Resolve. The quality. The, the scene to scene that he does 
Everything is identical. The only thing you're getting is size. It doesn't make it better. And that's what's confusing to people. Now, sorry, b- because we're giving each customer at FPP is getting two files. They're getting a HD MP4, which anyone can play, mm-hmm. and they're getting a ProRes.mov. That was going to be my next question, Mike, because I'm a Resolve user. I've been using, I've, ever since I started doing the YouTube stuff, I've moved entirely over to Resolve for my work. It's great, isn't it? It's the best. Like, and it's free. It's free. And the free version they upgraded. So like yeah, you can use all the really good stuff yep. for free now too. Definitely. So Resolve can also handle that really beefy media that I'm sure <laughs> would be like really, really hard to, to send out. But can that scanner do the um, those those really heavy files, the DPX files? Yes. Oh. Yes. I, now, see, now I'm gassed up because I've seen <laughs> DPX files for... Even two, even two K DPX file, like they just yeah. have everything in there. That, yes. that's full raw. Mm-hmm. Now we juggle between the consumer and the professional, mostly consumers who don't really know. And I think most of them are just playing the MP4 or using the MP4. Some folks aren't even editing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's going to look good. Yeah. wherever you upload it, with absolutely. An MP4. Yeah. But for the professional who's shooting something for a music video or a special project, they will say, hey, can you give us DPX files? Yes, absolutely. Can you give us this? Can you give us that? That's great. They'll also say, can you give it to me flat? The art of scanning, let's talk about scanning. And this, of course, applies to still photography as well. Everything's out the window because (laughs) people are scanning on the lamography with their phone. They're scanning with the uh, uh, negative supply, Mm -hmm. with their digital camera. With new digital Liza. Yeah. Yeah. The (laughs) basics are your waveform and your vector scope, which is your your levels of, Mm -hmm. you know... Your exposure and your color. Yeah. Yeah. If it's not scanned properly, your moving picture, your motion picture, if it's not scanned properly, you're effed. Because if... You know, if if a professional says to us, hey, I just need a flat scan because we're going to do all the color grading when our picture is cut. Mm-hmm. So then Dave will scan the image. He makes sure the back, the blacks aren't clipped, make sure all the whites aren't clipped. We have to make sure everything is proper so that when the person gets it, whatever software they're using, they can then do whatever they want. But they have the base of what they need. And if they ask for DPX files... That's fine, too. Now, me personally, I've never used DPX files, but my understanding, Matt, maybe you can tell me, is basically you're getting a TIFF of, like, yes. every single frame. frame. Yeah. yeah, so it's in the close, well, I mean, there are, no, there's no cameras, I think, that, that like, most mortals have access to which will shoot in DPX, but when you have a DPX, it's usually, like, the, 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 color, the colorist will request those. Right. So, yeah, each individual raw frame will be rendered out into, yeah, essentially a TIFF where it's like full information, nothing, no algorithms, no binning down of information. And it's it's absurd the size of some of those files, even a 1080 DPX file. So an MP4 that's a minute of 1080 footage could be, you know, 100 megabytes in a, in like a ProRes. Massive. But, but the DPX could be gigabytes for the same file. And then you extrapolate that to an hour, and this is where those workflows are cramming like terabytes and stuff of footage. But that's cool to know that you guys. That if you it's guys a do big that. project, I mean, think think you know, mo- think of a feature film length. Oh yeah, they're going through petabytes of data. So we'll set up the you know we'll do all the work, and the file transfer is like five p.m. Start the file transfer. Okay, see you later. Yeah, next Come day. back the next day, mm-hmm. and it in the morning it could still be transferring. When I engage with people, try to get a grasp of what it is they're. What's trying to do yeah. because even folks who send us three, four rolls of Super 8 and are asking for 4K and then send me uh, you know, a six gigabyte stick. <laughs> Not cutting it, pal. <laughs> you know, it's like, you, you, I, you, I don't know if people can understand the, the size of it. Also, I mean, I'm using um, Final Cut 10 mm-hmm. on, on a desktop Macintosh. Yeah. Even short form content, you doing 4K, it could choke a little bit. It adds up a lot, yeah. You know, you get sputtering. For folks at home who are just, you know, editing for fun or working on a little project, do now, you need 4K? I have, I have a question. Yes. Because um, I'm not up to the... I mean, my our TV at home is 32-inch, and it's 15 years old. Okay. If I had a 4K TV, let's say if... I don't know what it's... Like, an average size is to 46, 50-inch. Is that what most people have? I have, no, I have a small TV, but we don't watch a lot. Yeah. So, if I have a 4K TV... And I send my film to the to the FPP, and I'm like, I wanna, I'm gonna burn it to a Blu-ray, and I wanna show it to my family on my 4K TV at home. Let's say, let's say I have a 70-inch television. Do I need a 4K file 
to really get the optimal picture on my 60-inch 4K television. No, a lot of those TVs will up anyway. So I'd say a clean 1080 or 2K would still be good. Oh, gosh. You know, it's like, what, what, what can the naked eye really see from the perspective of sitting on the couch? I actually, you know, this is this, maybe this is my angry old man coming out. But, like, 8K? I don't need 8K. That makes my eyes hurt. There's I can't. A- yeah, a lot of buzz up. on the web about even scanning, especially mm-hmm. all the nerds in the in the movie mm-hmm. in the movie making. Oh, yeah. you know, like six point five k. Hey, uh-huh. our scanner now has six point five k scanning. So hey, what? we yeah. now have eight k. So what? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, unless you're Martin Scorsese, you don't. You really. You know, yeah, no. Unless you're like shooting a movie that you're going to, you know, project on the jumbotron. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Huge. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if there's a reason. If you're working on an IMAX project, yeah, then there's a great reason for it. That's why these, these exist. But some things never change in photography and, and movie making, and that is the boasting of the tech. Yeah. When the new tech that comes out, you go to the shows, it's like, cares. That reminds me so much of just working the retail floor at, at Midwest. It was like, uh, if it was a stills conversation, they always asked for the most megapixels first. If it was video, 6K, 8K. Has to shoot raw. Like, you, no. Yeah. You're getting this on a, on a potato. Come on. No, you don't. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to find answers for motion picture, especially the stuff we're talking about. 16, mm-hmm. Super 8, 8 millimeter. Most websites are from the 1990s. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's no, where do you go? Who's the, there's nothing the customers can't send us that we don't know how to handle. There's nothing, there's nothing, no question, no product, no camera you can throw at us that we will not be able to find a good answer. Uh, for the folks at home, there is this, uh, this brown oval uh, next to my <laughs> microphone. It says, this is a Keystone Model A7. That, whoa, this, is, this doesn't look like a, this is a 16 millimeter? Yes. It's really, I mean, it's pretty small. It, it weighs is. It weighs more than my mirrorless camera, but I'm guessing it's because it's loaded. So what's, what should I know about this, Mike? Very simple, which is great. So what you need to know about a, a Keystone A7, by the way, there's there's an A3, there's an A12. Almost all of them are exactly the same, except as the years got, as the years moved on, they improved it, they put leather on it, they had special editions. So first and foremost, you need to know, is it takes single perf or double perforated film? Oh, it takes both. Okay. No, it doesn't. Oh, oh, so each model will have... Yes. Okay, got so it, got it. I own an A12... Criterion Deluxe that Mark O'Brien gave to me. He's like, hey, I found this in a box. It's beautiful. <laughs> it just so happens that it's the Criterion Deluxe, so it takes single perforated modern 16 millimeter film. So most modern cameras are, are single perforated? Yes. Okay, so that means this being older, this is probably double. That is correct. Okay. That's where FPP excels in the sense that, oh my God, there are millions of these cameras out there. What do I do? Yeah. Contact Eastman Kodak. We need special order. So now we carry double perforated 50D, 500T, Ektachrome 100D, black and white reversal, black and white negative of various ISOs. And we get this comment all the time. We are, we, we, the FPP has the largest selection of double perf film anywhere in the world. And we are the reason, not to boast our ego, but it's true. Thanks to Mike's efforts, we are the oh, reason. Thank you. We are the reason that exists. Let's get that we audience are, track going. <laughs> we are the reason that when you open up the uh, Eastman Kodak motion picture film uh, price catalog, that those SKUs exist. Time to wake this show up. Where's Johnny Link? Right here, right here. Happy New Year's, John. So this is already loaded up. All right, I, I'm, I see a piece of gaffer tape on the other side here. 400 ISO, so... Black and white. Oh, black and white, Okay. And then, all right, on my, all right, so I see the hand cranks. So this is a hand crank. Underneath that, I see a, is this a gas gauge? What is this? Let me see. It, well, I'm guessing it starts at zero. Mine's currently. Oh, oh, it is the, uh, it's telling you how much film you have left in your camera. Oh, so this is my footage. Okay. Footage counter. And the footage counter is so simple. It's a gauge that's connected to a metal arm that rests on your take-up spool. Okay. And as the film fills up, it just changes the... It just moves it? Yeah, okay. That's it. And then... All right, so then below this, I see a little knob for speed control. Now, is this my... This isn't film speed. This is... Frames per second. Oh, frames per second. Okay. Wait, so this is being 16 mil. The normal is 16 frames per second? Correct. So that's going to be really dreamy kind of footage, right? Because the normal, I remember from a lot of the 
filmmaking tips is like one over twice your frame rates, like your normal like shutter speed type thing. Your shutter speed is fixed based upon how many frames per second you're shooting. Okay. So average, just so folks know, average frames per second for a professional motion picture with sound, 24. 24. Yeah. At 24 frames per second, your shutter speed changes to 150. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, 150th, yeah. rounded off, 150th of a second. Uh, Super 8 runs at 18 frames per second. Okay. Why? That's the way I invented it. Got it. Even the sound was 18 frames per second. Interesting. Old timey, the old brownies, 8 millimeter, 16 millimeter old timey, the average is 16 frames per second. Your, your naked eye will not notice a difference. Really? Okay. Will not. It which looks is, normal. Which is important because I see a lot of young photographers. They want to crank it. They want yeah. to crank it to 24 because that's, you know, what, that's what Martin Sorsese shoots at. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. And then so I see there's, there's low, which is 10. There's normal, which is 16. I wouldn't turn that. I'm not going to do that. It's 10. not tested. I may just break it. <laughs> it, feels, it feels pretty safe. Yeah. I'm not going to mess with it. All right. And then we have all these intermediate steps. And then this goes slow-mo at 64, which I'm – so that was, what's that? 4X then, right? Slow-mo, 64, yes. Yeah, 4X. Okay. Yes. Slow-mo. So, all right. The next question, if I'm – let's say I'm just going default. I'm locked on normal here. Uh, I've got 100 feet. My gas gauge shows I have a little bit to go. Gas What's my gauge. expected? How how much fo- raw footage do I have on a hundred feet? Spool? Sixteen millimeter at sixteen frames per second. It's like just a little under four minutes, right? Okay, so a hundred feet of sixteen millimeter at sixteen frames per second is four minutes it ten is over seconds. Four minutes. Okay, that's wow. not bad. No. Twenty four frames, two minutes forty seven seconds. Okay. So from a thrift perspective. I always say to folks, shoot please 16. shoot 16. Yeah, you get an extra minute. You're That's not going to notice the difference, and you're going to be able to, you know. And, and now with this the scanning software, too, like the difference between 16 and 24, you've got all that crazy stuff, the temporal correction and frame smoothing and all so that stuff. He, you, you could probably appreciate this and understand it. I can't. Because <laughs> I say to Dave, I'm like, okay, so, you know, video's 30 frames per second. Mm-hmm. So... How is the 16? He's like, okay. Well, you match the frame rate, right? Yes. He's like, we're sh- it's, it was scanned at 16 frames per second, but the MP4, it's in an envelope of 24 frames per it, second. It, it, it interpolates it. It yeah. does. Mm-hmm. But it, you don't, your eye's never going to see it. No. Yeah. Never. Uh, Leslie Lazenby, when you shot the county fair. Yes. Uh, Leslie was kind enough to give me full car blanche to edit. Yes. <laughs> I loved it the people on the rides mike is my re- he's, extremely he's really amateur look movie film and then mike edited it and he added the audio behind it and my, it just made there were two it. girls doing the thing where you throw the the, the ball little, into the yes, cup yes there's a little se- sound for each it's all rigged yeah. it's all rigged that's that's what sets a mike rosso like short <laughs> production from uh from completely shaky amateur footage is your sense of sound design. Yes. That's the best part. Yes. Sound design is like something that fascinates me because it's you can always tell when it's in there, but it's very hard to think about it when you're mm-hmm. looking through the footage. Like what does it what does it need? It takes a it takes a special yes. like sense for that. I've so, tried so many times. Oh really? You don't like it? You don't like doing it? It's not that I don't like doing it. No, I'm it's just not it's good a different at it. Yeah, you have to go into a different mindset it. about it. Because you, you know what you, what entertains you, so like, yes. that's when you throw it in. A happy new year to you all. You know, Matt, I have to tell you, all the folks here except for Owen been <laughs> on, been involved for a very long time. Man, we had some ramble fest back in 2012. Yes, we did. There was a four-hour podcast somewhere in the archive. Yeah. I remember when we were still doing some stuff on tape, there was one that went like two and a half hours. Yeah. It was wild. Yeah. There were some long shows, so I guess we'll see everyone next time. Podcast at filmphotographyproject.com. As a matter of fact, you know, back in the day, we, the podcast was so new, we used to call it an internet radio show. <laughs> that was that was going on for a long time, probably Damn right. 2015. Yeah. Yeah. I see, see ya. ya. Here's a smooth cut. Wouldn't want to be ya. Here's a smooth Here's cut. A smooth Here's cut. A smooth cut. You know, I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs>
And um, 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 uh, um, 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 and um, 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 uh, um, 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 and um, 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 uh, um, 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 and um, 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 and um, 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 um,
are. Here on BBC One, after the striking of Big Ben, we welcome the New Year in by going to Scotland for a lively celebration. And those taking part include Jim Watt, the McCalmans, Jim Johnston's Scottish Country Dance Band, and many others besides. Time to wake this show up. Yeah. yeah. Where's Johnny Lake? Right here, right here. Happy New Year's, John. This is your buddy.